Hello, everyone, and welcome to Amnesty International and Fight for the Future's third salon on the implications of Web3 technologies for human rights and activism. I'm Leah Holland, Campaigns and Communications Director with Fight for the Future. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm based in Portland, Oregon. First, house rules for the chat. One, assume good intentions from those you're interacting with and our speakers. We're here to have a conversation and learn. Two, treat folks with basic respect and decency. And three, no spam, but posting relevant, relevant resources is welcome. And with that, I'll introduce our subject. What should we build? Seeking to present some futures to fight for and principles we can unite around as we engage with the next generation of the internet. This group of panelists is particularly exciting because their focuses span the range from artists' rights to working with indigenous communities in the Amazon. I expect we're about to have quite a nuanced discussion of what features the future web should offer from the perspective of those engaged in making the internet a better place for the communities they serve and are a part of. Being able to name values and principles for an internet that puts the interests of everyday people and especially traditionally marginalized people at the center is a wonderful basis for having hopeful and collaborative conversations between advocates and web projects that aspire to do good. We hope that the perspectives from these technologists and activists today will help all of us on that road amid the hype and controversy the mainstream crypto movement has sparked. And a disclaimer, uh, Web3 is a term we're using broadly to refer to the next, next version of the internet. We aren't interested in letting crypto boosters claim this term and imply that the futures, uh, possible futures of the internet are limited to blockchain alone however interesting and, as you will hear from some of our panelists today, important decentralized ledger technology is. It is essential for Web3 developers and activists to discuss what could be built and why and who new technology harms or benefits. If we want a better internet, we have to engage and fight for it. And in that spirit, I will hand this off to Michael Kleiman, director of the Silicon Valley Initiative at Amnesty International. Hi, everyone, and thank you guys so much for, for joining, as Leah said, the, the third salon that we're doing on this topic. And it's amazing to be able to do this with Fight for the Future and follow Fight for the Future's lead on this. Um, Leah summed up pretty much all the reasons that I'm incredibly excited to listen to, to our panelists and why I think this is such an important conversation, especially to have now when the debate around Web3 is, if anything, only continuing to, to pick up speed. I am insanely excited to introduce our four amazing panelists today. We have Emily Jacoby, who's the executive director and founder of Digital Democracy. We have Charlie Johnson, who's the founder of Untangled, a newsletter and podcast about technology, people, and power. And if you aren't reading it, you should certainly should. He's also a program director at Data and Society and an adjunct professor at GW, but today he's speaking in his, um, in his role as the founder of Untangled. We have Martin Walre Walreven, who's the head of operations and production at, Symf at Symphony, co-editor of Music X, and the co-project lead at Water and Music Academy. And last but very much not least, we have Claire Sal, who's the founding officer and director of the Filecoin Foundation. We're going to ask each of our panelists to speak just for, for five or so minutes each. And then what we're going to do is open it up to a question and answer. If anyone has any questions that they would like, please, please, this is meant to be a conversation. And so we would love for there to be, as Leah said, a really respectful dialogue. So any questions at all that you have, please put them in the chat. Leah and I will um, record, we will tag them and um, do our best to make sure that, that they get asked. So without any further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Emily and thank you guys again. Sorry. Emily, you are muted. Great. I'm so focused on getting my screen share set. Um, well, it's it's an honor to be here and part of this conversation. Um, we have 
At Digital Democracy, we're a nonprofit. We're based in the US, but we have a global team um, across three different continents. And our work is with marginalized and frontline communities um, across the world. And we've really been heads down, I think, in our work, closely working with local partners. So it's exciting to kind of take some of the lessons we've learned and share them in this context. Um, but as an organization, our mission is to work in solidarity with frontline communities um, who are using technology to defend their human and environmental rights. And our work is very much at the intersection of human and environmental rights. We do two things in our work. We are invited by local communities to support them in doing tech trainings and tech support. And after many years of doing that, we saw persistent gaps in technology and that led us to actually start building out tools. So that's what I'll focus on today is the tools that we've been building and why. So just to give you some context, um, right now we're working across multiple continents, but for many years we were focused on the Amazon working with indigenous groups who were dealing with a variety of threats, including oil spills, illegal mining, deforestation, forest fires, land invasions. And we were working with them because they were asking for ways to use technology to document these threats, but we found uh, persistent challenges. So existing tools often don't work offline, especially those that are easy to use, um, or they're prohibitively expensive, and they are often very difficult to use. And then finally, they concentrate information in a centralized location, which often means outside of where communities live. So um, here's an example of uh, one of my colleagues, Jen Castro, doing a training with uh, Atuar um, communities in, the, in northern Peru. And as they're, um, you know, as they've been gathering evidence of, uh, of oil spills on their phones, often using prior tools that we were using, all that information was being stored in faraway servers that they didn't even have access to due to lack of internet access. So we built a tool called Mapbeo. It's a free digital tool set for documenting, monitoring, and mapping many different types of data. It can do a lot of different things. Um, and the, the resulting solution is both a mobile app, a desktop application, and it's all powered by a backend decentralized database. It's not exactly a blockchain, um, but it has a lot of similarities in terms of how the information is stored, how it's shared amongst partners, and, um, and that it's a peer-to-peer -peer database. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, it's offline first. It allows our partners to gather all the information they need locally. They can share it amongst themselves, amongst their devices. And most importantly to us and to our partners, the communities really own the data. And we've really grounded all of the data architecture in the principles of indigenous data sovereignty. Right now it's being used um, in, across uh, multiple countries, um, 20, 21 countries at our latest count, um, uh, 35 different project areas. So often there will be multiple project areas in a particular country. Um, we know of at least 760 land defenders who are actively using it to, to, to defend over 5 million hectares of territory. Um, and we also, because it's offline, a decentralized tool, it can be downloaded and then shared um, uh, device to device without having to go through the Play Store um, or through our website. And so there actually are probably many other users that we don't even know about. And then I'll just end with a couple of, um, so these are some screenshots of the mobile app and you can see how it's really easy. We made it very simple to use. The idea is that we can train people in an hour on how to use it and they can go out and begin gathering data, um, including for people who have never used a computer before. So um, very icon heavy. We work with communities to actually put the icons um, and the descriptions in their own languages. Sometimes it's multilingual, sometimes it's just an indigenous language. And then they can also see all of their observations as well as those of their, their community members. Um, and just a few more details on kind of the observation view where you can see it on a map. Uh, this is a close up of a particular observation and then how we do the synchronization between uh, desktops and phones. So I'll leave it there and pass it to, uh, to Charlie. Awesome. Uh, so my name is Charlie Johnson, and I founded Untangled, which is a newsletter and podcast about technology, people, and power. In the next five minutes, I'm going to tell you a story about a guy named Alex. 
overview of the new Web3 phenomenon of social tokens or creator coins, and explain how they might turn creators into stocks and fan communities into investors and why this could all be a problem. So a year and a half ago, a guy named Alex conducted the first ever, quote, human IPO. He created the Alex token and raised $20,000 by selling 100,000 tokens to 29 participants. Token holders were guaranteed 15% of Alex's income over the next three years. Anyone with an Alex token could exchange it for a retweet, a one-on-one -on -one conversation, or an introduction to someone in his network. Alex, the re Alex recently launched a program he calls, quote, Control My Life, granting token holders the ability to participate in a non-binding vote on his life choices, like what hobby he should prioritize in a given month. This is the new Web3 phenomenon of creator coins or social tokens that purport to be the next-gen business model for creators, artists, athletes, and musicians. Here's the basic idea. Any creator or influencer with a following can create a fungible token and then decide what rights a token gives a holder. This can be stuff like access to merch, backstage passes at a concert, invitations to private events, and so on. Then the creator can start handing out the token, selling them. The use of smart contracts enables a direct relationship between the creator and their audience. Now, before I get into the issues associated with social tokens, it's worth saying that Web2 is pretty terrible for the vast majority of creators. The creator economy mostly resembles the economic stratification of the US. For example, on Patreon, only 2% of creators make the federal minimum wage. On Spotify, the top 1% of artists make 90% of the royalties, which you know is not great. Um, so imagine that I decided to launch an untangled token for my newsletter. I would give them to my early readers, that could be you, and then you could use them to access exclusive content from me. If Untangled becomes super popular, more people will want to own the token, which means the value of it goes up and we all win. But if you no longer wanted to hold Untangled tokens for whatever really rude reason, you could sell them or trade them for other tokens, and then the value of Untangled would go down. Here's the important part, though. The token doesn't just affect the value of my newsletter, it changes my role in our relationship. In effect, I've become something of a stock, and you've become an investor. This also shifts the location of my precarity. I might not be subject to the whims of algorithmic tweaks or finicky policy changes by big tech platforms, but I'm now subject to the vagaries of the market or pump and dump precarity. Instead of turning to engagement metrics to understand what makes for a successful post, I'll be encouraged to develop content that pushes my token price up in value. I'm no longer just a stock, I've become a financial analyst. Moreover, as someone who has spent a number of years researching online disinformation, I have no trouble imagining that groups of people will organize campaigns to discredit the reputation of creators they don't like and tank the prices of their tokens. Imagine the phenomena of memes donks, but applied to people, not companies. You know, there's not, there's a lot we still don't know, but as social movements consider the adoption of blockchain technology and the use of fungible tokens, it's critical to remember that technologies do not themselves solve for intractable social problems. In fact, they often make them worse under the guise of progress. Technologies, of course, interact with social structures, power dynamics, economic incentives, and cultural norms. In the case of social tokens, they insert financial logics and incentives into people and our relationships. Thank you. Charlie, thank you so much. And, and Emily, thank you so much. And, and Martin, over to you, sir. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks, Emily and Charlie. That was already really amazing um, to listen to and um, to absorb. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to maybe be a little bit more um, optimistic, perhaps. Um, so when, um, kind of similar to like 
what Charlie was saying about the creator economy, and I'm sorry I have a cold, so um, hang on a minute. Musicians are also um, struggling a lot to make money. And one of the promises of this creator economy is that by better being able to monetize the, the artist to fan relationship, um, that will improve, right? Um, and we started in 2008 with the 1000 fan uh, theory. Um, that became a 100 fan theory. So that's a thousand people who are willing to spend a hundred dollars per year on you or a hundred fans who are willing to spend a thousand dollars per year on you. Especially in the latter case with the 100 fans, that means you have to add real value to whatever it is that, that constitutes that relationship to whatever it is that you give those fans. Um, you can also think with the rise of NFTs and the crazy amounts of money that have been going around there <clears throat> that, okay, so there's also cult fans. Um, and these cult fans, you might only need one. So, um, and this person will then spend, I don't know, 20 ETH on your um, NFT, and then you can uh, live your uh, life, make your art for at least a while again. Um, and I guess one of the things that um social tokens specifically bring into that dimension is that you don't have to add liquidity to social tokens um so they can really just be uh status signifiers and in the end a lot of what we do as humans is that we are status monkeys so we like to kind of go around and, and show that we are a part of a group or that we are in the know about something um and yeah, things that are digital have often been really bad timing to, for my nose to start running. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, of course, I lost my train of thought as well. So um, one of the things that um, we are seeing with this kind of a pyramid of like fans um, is that it we can start to flip it around um so i call this flipping the funnel a lot of times we talk about okay you know we have to go on social media and um, if you release a music video on youtube you can reach two billion people you don't actually reach those two billion people of course um and then you whittle it down until you find the people that actually care about what you do when you flip the funnel, you start to look for those people who are going to actually engage with you. And you start to build your community from the other way up. And I think that's one of the, uh, one of the ways in which so social tokens, for example, can play a role um, and in which things like NFTs can also play a role. Um, although those would always involve money while a social token doesn't necessarily um, have to be about like how much money does somebody have how much money can somebody invest um so that's sort of there's a change happening there um and i think what that boils down to in terms of web3 is um that we are kind of rethinking how we approach community so if you look at music specifically you have um artists and you have fans and a lot of the discussions that are happening around things like NFTs or other types of tokens are aimed at from the artist to the fan. But it can also be the other way around, you know? So the fans can also be the, 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 the ones that start the community. And this happens a lot, of course. Fan culture is big. Fan culture has always been big. In the 80s, everybody was writing their own little fanzines. And now, um, you know, we started to write blogs or um, organize ourselves around the internet um, with the most famous example probably being the BTS army. Um, and this is um, in a way going to kind of change the way that we look and at music and perhaps the arts more, more, more generally, um, because we're going back to somewhere um, where music isn't necessarily just being made because of this art for art's sake principle that we've become really used to. Um, musicians are these uh, 
um, people who from an innate desire create art um, and share it with the world whether you know they're going to make money or not and now if you find a small group of people you can start organizing yourselves as a community with um, a multi uh, multi-directional communication so it's not an audience so it's not one person talking to a lot of people but it's a lot of people talking to each other um, and that creates a lot of value because that then also becomes something that other people want to become a part of um, so I have a quote that I'm just going to pull up for myself um, which is from MC Richard and it's um, it's all the arts we practice our apprenticeship the big art is our lives. And I think it's really important to understand that when you share something with somebody, um, you already become a, a collaborator with them. Um, and with in Web3, it becomes possible to kind of solidify that, that the ideas of ownership and community that uh, are a part of that um, and formalize those. And I think that's very worthwhile to explore Thank you very much. Martin, thank you. And Clara, please take us, please take us home. I think I'm sharing my screen. So I'm gonna just have a very short presentation here, but um, I wanna talk, the bridging off of what others have already said. Uh, am, I, am I on mute or am I, you guys can hear me. Okay, great. So. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, I'm the founding officer and director of the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. Today, uh, I just wanted to touch upon the topic that is on the backbone of what everyone else has said, data ownership, really the relationship that has changed within owning data that comes from creators, from musicians, um, from helping marginalized communities, right? These are all populations and groups that for a very long time have had no data ownership. And um, I'm going to just start off by talking about Filecoin, what is the foundation, and what is FFDW. And so Filecoin was started in 2017 out of a company called Protocol Labs. Um, like any kind of project, um, we open sourced, and we obviously wanted to make sure there was fair governance for the community. The Filecoin Foundation was started almost two years ago um, in terms of having staff and having um, full manpower behind it. And then we also have a 501c3 arm. Filecoin Foundation for the Centralized Web, where we fund a number of initiatives to really further uh, social impact in the decentralized web. So I'm just going to cover a couple of examples. So work so far, um, we have helped equip key communities around the world to store their vital information on resilient, user-empowered, decentralized networks. So you can see some of the nonprofits here. These are all incredible human rights and journalism organizations that we're really hoping they can store their data in a secure way that allows them to do their best work without interference from authoritarian governments, from other places. We're also testing and improving um, ways to uh, improve the rights of sensitive data. Um, and this is an especially important in human rights, journalism fields and beyond. And then finally, making sure that policymakers, lawmakers, the general public, uh, they have all the information that they need um, to really decide for themselves and also understand uh, the complications of, of Web3 as well, because obviously there are a lot of scams, there are bad actors. I know a few of us on this call have worked in disinformation, right? So with any kind of large community coming onto any key network, um, there will be good along with the bad, which will lead policymakers to come in. Quick slide about everyone on the team. Um, so myself and Megan are the founding uh, officers. And then we have a number of people that are coming from a vast array of backgrounds from um, traditional grant making uh, to EFF to, to other places like Amidiar um, that are really helping us think through uh, how to do the best work we can in this space. Um, so how do we go about building a better web um, at the Filecoin Foundation and FFCW? Um, we call it the ABCs. We accelerate adoption of open decentralized technologies. We want to build these communities that are not only mutually supporting, but also self-sustaining. And then we also want to be able to communicate this. And this is the last point I made previously on our work with policymakers. 
And so um, a couple of things that we hope to accomplish this year is really help civil society organizations, very much like many of you guys that might be tuning in on this call, or if you guys are activists, we want to help you guys be able to store and share your vital civil rights records. We also want to provide the right tools. And um, we're building a bunch right now to help ensure that the material is on resilient decentralized networks that risks efforts for others to control the data. This kind of stems back to all the work that others are doing from artists to creators uh, to individuals who are now giving up their ownership, right? And letting the public decide their path, like in the case of Alex. Um, and then finally deliver solutions to vital organizations in a variety of different fields, right? So there's human rights, but there's also so much application in health science environment. We're doing a lot in, for example, transparent data reporting on energy use um, through an initiative called File Point Green. Um, so this is just a repetition of before, really hoping to help empower the skill gaps. Um, Web3 right now, we say it's inclusive, but really it isn't. There's is still a very large digital literacy divide over who has access and who doesn't. And so we really want to be thoughtful with making sure that we're speaking to um, speaking to the work that really is inclusive of everyone around the world. Um, so um, I wanted to jump into a spotlight. Um, I think many of you guys may have heard about this project, but um, one example of an initiative that we're very proud to fund is the Starling Lab. Um, we It was co-founded by the USC Shoah Foundation and Stanford's Department of Electrical Engineering, really to, to talk about how do we protect human rights um, with decentralization. So we're developing open source tooling to enable encrypted mobile capture solutions for real-time human rights documentation. So I know Ukraine is a topic heavy on our hearts right now. Um, these are really, really important to make sure that we can store important archival information, but also capture it um, at the point of capture um, with the right verification, right? So um, photos are not being docked, et cetera. So um, I will pause right there because I know um, this is meant to be short. Um, we also fund incredible organizations like Internet Archive. We give them the equivalent of close to $10 million um, early last year uh, to really make sure that we're thinking about preservation of internet history, just as important as we're thinking about preservation of physical libraries. And unfortunately today, like we said, we, we, we are in a ecosystem where data we're constantly consuming, but it's also very expensive to upkeep. And most of the data sits within the hands of five providers like AWS, Microsoft, Google, um, we can name all of them Apple. And so um, really thinking about a better way to store information that is truly decentralized and truly democratic. Um, that is our goal. Uh, today, over 50 million NFTs are stored on Filecoin. So if you own an NFT, you're most likely using our technology. Uh, we also store so much important information like what I just presented with Starling, where we've archived 50,000 testimonials of Holocaust survivors through the USC Shoah Foundation. So um, these records have to be kept somewhere. Uh, and we hope to be able to really archive and record keep the most important information. Um, we can't do this alone, right? And so all of you guys on this call, um, we want your help. So definitely reach out and end with my information. All right. Thank you so much, Clara. That was fantastic. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're big fans of, of Filecoin's work over here at Fight for the Future. Um, so yeah, now that we've heard from everybody, uh, I, we're going to transition to some Q&A. Uh, and for everybody listening, feel free to hop into the little Q&A module and uh, add your questions. We have a bunch uh, already on this list that I'm looking at. So uh, this could be a question for everybody, but comes from, uh, from Charlie's portion of the talk. Uh, so Charlie, you talked about how social tokens might impact creators, but what about social movements, community-based organizations, et cetera? How might we see, what are the different possible futures of how tokenization might play out for, um, for, for, for social movements or community organizations? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that you know, the concern I raise in my talk, I think still applies. Launching a publicly traded token uh, would, well, let me back up for a second. The first thing to say really is that there's not a lot of research into how this is playing out in practice. And this is all very new. 
So the answer is, I don't know. Um, but to sort of speculate wildly for a minute, I could imagine a few things popping up. Um, the first of which is, you know, the concern I raised in my talk still applies that launching a publicly traded token would effectively turn these organizations into something of an equity and people would in turn speculate on their value. So you might remove the dependency on funders, for example, but you become subject to the whims of the marketplace. The, the second point I'd make though, is that introducing publicly traded tokens would likely influence the missions of these groups. So the mission would no longer just be social or political in nature, but shaped by the desire for the token price to go up in value. And I have to imagine that would influence organizational decision-making in some way. The third thing that comes to mind is, you know, I often hear that tokens will help to democratize governance. And I think that's a, a big assumption for us to test. I think it's possible that distributing tokens will allow more people to contribute to the governance process in some way. But most projects I've seen tend to operate on a one token, one vote policy, which would only reaffirm existing societal inequities. If you can afford more tokens, you would have more voting power. And then last, you know, say I'm wrong about all of that, um, that it doesn't distort the mission. The organization really does redistribute power in a meaningful and equitable way. And the organization is wildly successful as a result and the token price reflects that success and goes up in value. Well, in that case, you've become something of a victim of your own success because increasingly people won't be able to afford to become a member of the organization. The token price goes up in, a, in value, at least partially sacrifices the social movement or organization's commitment to broad and inclusive participation. Charlie, thank you so much. Um, I have a, a quick follow, a quick question from uh, Elizabeth from Amnesty. Um, and this is for, for really any of the panelists who wanna jump in. Um, it's a broad question, but I think it's really important. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges when it comes to democratizing the use of blockchain tech for good challenges? Um, or sorry, what are some of the challenges that come from democratizing use of blockchain tech for good causes? And I was wondering if, if each panelist could just say what they think the number one challenge that they see when it comes to democratizing the use of this technology for good is. And just looking at my screen, maybe we could go Clara, Martin, um, Emily, and then Charlie. Yeah, I think this is a really great question. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges to democratization and also to blockchain is content moderation, right? Everyone has their own judgment on what is good and what is bad. With blockchain, you have ultimate permanence of certain types of information in the human rights and journalism space. If you have lack of integrity in that process, you have lack of trust across the board. And so um, it's so important that we continue to upkeep good information and also make sure that they're coming from vetted sources as we're thinking about preservation of data and also making sure we have the right moderation tools. So that's an area that we've been investing heavily in um, is making sure that as we're building, you know, the layer of uh, storage for Web3, we are also thinking very much on these thorny topics that are very much challenges that we haven't even solved in Web2 right now. Um, so I, I think that's one aspect and also just digital divide, as, as I mentioned earlier, is a huge challenge to make sure we get truly democratic participation. Yep, very much. <laughs> um, I, I, I wanna raise um, Protein. I don't know if uh, people here are aware of Protein. They're a, a, a kind of budding DAO um, who are working on this good growth mechanism. Um, I can share a link in the chat uh, if necessary, but they do excellent work in this regard. Um, and I think the number one um, issue is um, access and education, um, because there is just a very steep barrier to entry and a very steep learning curve when you will enter this space. So if you look at some of the music artists who have been doing this for a long time, 
I'm thinking of an artist like Rack or uh, Blau, um, who were active in the sort of the first wave of, of blockchain activity um, in 2015, 2016, 2017, um, and who are now kind of breakout artists who a lot of people look at uh, to see how it should be done um, or how it could be done. And you, you see that there is still just not that many people that are doing it. Um, so everything is still very experimental. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you just want to look at another use case of somebody who is doing the right kind of experiments, in my opinion, it's uh, an artist called Black Dave. Um, so he has a social token, but there's no liquidity attached to it. Um, so it's handed out on the basis of, you know, people helping other people out on his discord or, um, you know, um, uh, doing, uh, uh, good things for each other, um, assisting in the mental health session and discord, etc. Um, and on the other hand, um, he, he does stuff with NFTs, um, which is also cool. Um, but this is the kind of, yeah, I mean, this, this is just one, one guy, of course, and he is experimenting a lot. Um, but it's super interesting to follow those kinds of people um, because they are working really hard to bring people in and um, to, to explain exactly what it means to do that. Yeah, it's such a <clears throat> complex question and a lot of good points have already been raised. I would say, you know, building further off of the, the digital divide issue is well, blockchain can mean so many different things to so many different people. And I think it's it's a somewhat messy term. Um, and, you know, should the question even be, should we be democratizing blockchain or just how do we further democratize technology um, and, you know, really put it in the hands that should be, um, should be being, being built by the people who are going to use it. And so in our process, because we were kind of co-designing our tools from the very start, we didn't set out to build a Web3 technology per se, the decision to do decentralized, the decision to do offline first, all these things were based on what the needs and desires were of the users. Um, and so then that kind of came naturally. Um, and then I guess the other thing I would just say is, you know, when blockchain does involve kind of the computer data uh, generated algorithms and, and, and consensus, just the high environmental impact of those needs, I think, we can't, nothing is going to be democratic in the world we currently live in if it's taking huge amounts of um, server space and other things that are just having such an impact on our on our climate. So I think that that also aspect of when we talk about blockchain or Web3 is really critical to discuss. So I, I would add that, you know, democratizing technology doesn't democratize power, right? So. I used to work at USAID trying to think of ways we might use mobile technology to change sort of how we do international development work. And the story of much of the sort of mobile tech work is that access and adoption improved, yet that often translated into reaffirming existing inequities and making some problems worse. And so as we think about you know, the, the rise of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. Um, and as we think about improving people's lives and solving societal problems, it's, I'm gonna sort of call back to what I said at the end of my presentation, which is that it's critical to remember that technologies do not themselves solve for intractable, intractable social problems. And sometimes they make them worse under the guise of progress. And so it's critical that we like really interrogate how the adoption of these technologies interact with social structures, power dynamics, economic incentives, and cultural norms. Thank you all. That was fantastic. Um, so I wanted Emily to kind of dig in a little bit more on decentralization specifically as, as, as a choice in your work with marginalized communities and, and why that was um, so important. And it'd also be, uh, it would be also interesting to, to get an idea of like what might go wrong with a centralized database among the marginalized communities you serve to just kind of be very concrete about um, about this, this aspect in particular of, of what you're working on. Yeah, thank you. Um, to give some concrete examples, uh, 
so many of the communities we are working with are for various reasons collecting data. Sometimes it's for external reasons because they need to create reports to send to governments or to hold a company accountable. And other times it's internal, you know, they wanna create a map in their own language um, to, to manage their own resources. They wanna um, map, you know, sacred spaces or other things that's always intended to be uh, kept internal to the community and that nobody else has access to, including us, um, you know, as the app builders. So we, I, I have this vivid memory of um, of being with partners in Guyana who had gone out and were documenting illegal gold mining happening in their community. And this was before Mapbeo existed. Um, and we were using just a, you know, one of many um, like open source Android, Android mobile phone uh, app collecting tools. And they went out, they, they documented it, they, got, they gathered information, and then they were sitting down in the village before they got to where the internet was, uh, like underneath the mango tree to, to write all the information from, from the phone into their notebook. And we asked, why were they doing that? And they explained that because as soon as they went to go put it um, online, it would disappear off their phone because the, the app had been designed that way. So it was designed for, so that university researchers could have all the information in a centralized database, but that the, the people actually collecting the data wouldn't have the data on their phone anymore. And they were still accountable to going to their village and com you know, communicating to the village what they'd learned. So they needed to have all that information um, you know, analog as well as since it was going to disappear from digital. Um, and that just really struck me that, of course, from a university researcher's perspective, as long as they get all the information in their centralized database, that's fine, it's all there, but that doesn't mean that it's actually available, particularly to the communities, you know, who are gathering the data and who, who actually, it affects their lives, not just their ability to write a research paper. Um, and so that that was a, you know, really transformative moment for us that, that further made us look into what are alternate options to make an offline tool work that where they can still share information. And so decentralized just made sense. So essentially, you know, the data is, is distributed across all the different devices within a trusted network. Our partners are very much um, based on trusted networks. And, and so the use case is for groups that already trust each other, which helps bicep some of the sidestep some of the issues that, you know, in a, in a more, uh, uh, diverse group you might have around like content moderation and other things, but within our, our particular use case, our partners are working within trusted networks and, and usually keeping that data internally, and then sometimes choosing to share some of that data externally. Emily, thank you so much. And a vaguely similar question actually to, to Clara. Um, I'm curious, just the reaction that you hear from the NGO community. Um, what are some of the hesitations that you hear about sort of the decentralized web in general? And then how do you respond to those hesitations or those concerns? Yeah, I think like any kind of emerging technology, there is a um, there is an optimism, especially among people with interests like the venture capital community, and Andreessen Horowitz, a number of these parties to really say everything that is good from it. And I think right now there is a subsection of the Web2 community that does feel like there is a lot of overpromise and underdelivery, and also the lack of forethought in thinking about certain spaces. And I, I think that part is absolutely true. Um, I think there are definitely a number of bad actors in Web3 uh, that um, often get spotlighted, but there are also very good actors, right? And so I think, a number of the work that we're trying to do at Filecoin Foundation and FFDW is to tell the good and the bad and, and to have people choose their own adventure. Um, there's gonna be challenges with DAOs. There's gonna be challenges with all kinds of models. And sometimes it's hard for people doing good work to talk about their failure points because they don't want it to be a reflective failure of everything else that is good, right? And so that's that continues to be a challenge, but um, that's what I would say is we, um, we actually have a program called Explore Awards for anyone that would like to explore and understand the decentralized web. You can apply for a grant up to $10,000 from us. Um, and we want you to learn on your own, join some DAOs, participate, make your own decision, right? And I think it's very easy in our uh, information attention economy to just read headlines and to just hear perspectives without actually going through 
the ebb and flow of experiencing it. So that's what I would say is people should make their own minds. We live in a free country with, you know, the privilege of freedom of speech and freedom of expression and people should, should figure it out. But um, I, I definitely think that we want, we should openly talk about the challenges and we should not necessarily promise that Web3 is going to solve everything in Web2 because it's not. And can I just add something to that? Yeah. So uh, one of my key key gripes <clears throat> in um, in uh, everything related to Web three is a, a lack of uh, institutional memory. So um, a lot of people uh, are uh, very excited and say that they're going to fix everything, um, but they're not. And 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 then they come up with a solution um, that has already some at some point in, in time been attempted. So just to bring it to a musical example um, in the first wave of blockchain um, the first companies were all going to fix music rights and royalties um, and that is very very difficult because music copyright is a hella difficult and complicated uh, structure um, and what I like about the more recent experiments is that they're much smaller so they're much more at scale um, and uh, much more focused on just um, human problems right so a lot of crypto a lot of problems that are that people talk about as if they're crypto problems are actually human problems and about the way that, the ways that humans connect together which is why i definitely think we should talk about co-ops whenever we talk about stuff like DAOs and decentralized autonomous you know ways of organizing people Great answers. Again, thank you all so much. This is doing this is so fun for me personally. Um, okay, so um, and 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 I'm going to speak to this through the lens of music, but really I think that it applies to you know any anybody who's participating in this space as a as as a user or a small business or what have you. Um, so I'm thinking back as somebody with history in the music industry. Uh, to the 2010s and the phenomenon of the artist owned email list that for a time there were artists like Amanda Palmer who owned this really powerful and, and who still still do but email maybe is a little bit you know it's not a new new marketing form anymore and, and, and we get so much spam that it's, it's maybe a bit less effective, but um, artists like Amanda Palmer owned these huge email lists of, of, of emails and location data. So they were able to target by zip code and say, hey, I'm playing Denver, Colorado next week, <laughs> get a ticket. And, um, and that for, for you know, a while there, artists had this extremely powerful connection through a protocol email that um, nobody could take away from them necessarily and that nobody else could control. And the way that you know Facebook event pages used to be the lifeblood of getting the word out about a show, and um, and now they are more or less useless um, unless you pour a lot of money into to paying Facebook to show the the event page to the people who've already said they're your fans. So I'm wondering how if if folks have thoughts, uh, Martin. Obviously, I bet you will. But um, if folks have thoughts about how we could ensure that um, artists, users, small businesses continue to own the connections that they're being promised here directly versus once again being intermediated and shut away from you know their fans, their their um, customers, et cetera, as as happens on um, everything from you know Facebook to Spotify now, at least in the music music context. Yeah, I'll, I, I'm happy to let other people go first. <laughs> Charlie, I'm, Charlie has to jump off in just two minutes. Charlie, if you want to answer this one, then we can go to, to Martin or or not. I think I think it's all Martin. I don't I don't, <laughs> I don't have a lot to say on that topic. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's just so like the 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 one major difference that we're face that we're kind of moving towards is that you do own right what you put in so um a lot of the times when i talk in groups about uh, doing something in web3 then they say oh but we can also do this in web2 right so hey i can do a kickstarter um and it might be the same as raising some money um from uh, nfts or uh, other kinds of tokens um 
and but there there is a key difference there and that that is definitely in in the data ownership um and what's so interesting about this whole digital sort of evolution into web3 is that um there is now a digital layer of ownership and um that is valuable and uh, for me that penny kind of dropped when um, the the beeple uh, thing happened because then i i realized oh right so you have the artwork and the ip related to that is still with the artist then you have somebody can buy that artwork off of them or off of whoever owns it but then we can add a third layer a digital layer of ownership and everybody can kind of agree that that's that that exists and we i mean it's not contractual there's, there's no legal definitions for it yet we need a lot of litigation to kind of make that happen and we'll see that happening in about five years from now um but there's just a lot to play around with when um when you start to move away from the platform economy and into web3 style organizing of people um that you know allows you to kind of take your um your input and your value that you created with you you know this silly example that most people will have heard about this the friends with benefits if you were early and you bought the fwb token then um and you you know you got sick and tired of all the kind of uh, vc people coming in and you didn't like the the culture anymore then you were the person who made that group more valuable so when you sell your token it, it, it is more valuable that is sort of the the positive spin on it and then please do take into account everything charlie says when you think about it that way so i think like thank you martin i think maybe you know i want to artists speak here in this question uh, and so i'm wondering if i could rephrase really quick it seems like there is a lot of momentum towards um replicating the intermediation of web two in web three that we are um that that, that you know fi financial traditional financial institutions or invest investment funds or what have you are are are, are looking to re-implement the power structures they know in which you know under surveillance capitalism in which they own the data i think about like microsoft talking about um uh, their digital identity project and how um, that could provide perfect data to advertisers or to universities or what have you, um, you know, potentially without the, the informed consent of the people that data is about. And so I'm curious if like if anybody else has thoughts about how to prevent the same problems in terms of intermediation uh, and, and maybe potentially exploitation from coming with us um, as, as we make new tools. My my answer to that would be to just to to stay aware of that, right? Um, and um, look up um, those actually decentralized intermediaries that exist now. So, um, yeah, um, I think one of the one of the issues is that maybe um, for larger scale adoption. <laughs> We kind of need um, a lot of people to adopt it, right? And um, um, in in that sense, it helps if Instagram starts doing blockchain-related stuff. Um, but it doesn't help in the sense that it then becomes a, a centralized party that is going to keep everything centralized. So while that is happening, you need to also keep pushing and experimenting with the properly decentralized um, stuff, just to keep it a bit broad. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in here. I think one of the most interesting parts of Web3 for me is really around community governance and the different kinds of mini experiments that are happening, whether it's an organizational form for blockchain projects, whether this is happening at the DAO level, right? So there's so much types of governance that everyone has set up. And sometimes that is inclusive of the community. Sometimes that's a little bit more narrow in order for decision making. And then the third part is really sometimes there is a financial layer of incentive that draws people to participate in different ways. And so I think that part is 
so important for people to spend their time to understand and uh, really understand the different levels of governance that a lot of people just in the Web2 economy, they don't really even think about the opportunity to, to be able to offer insight at that level, so. Thank you guys. And we have time for, for one last question. We'll go to Tiara Roxanne's question from the chat, which is, which raises a lot of incredibly important issues. I'm going to, to focus on just one of the issues that, that she raises. And I'd love to hear uh, each, of the, um, each of the panelists if possible. I mean, she asks, how does, and she's speaking about Emily, but I think it's Emily Napio, but I think it's more generally applicable. How does this application specifically serve indigenous communities outside the white gaze? And I think in addition to sort of that question, one of the things that I think most is most fascinating about Web3 is this question of power and how it shifts power dynamics. And what are you as panelists, what do you think are the promises is most promising when it comes to Web3, when it comes to, to shifting power away from those who've traditionally had it? And in what ways does Web3 potentially allow communities and others that have not had access to power, that have been subject to the white gaze, or in other ways disenfranchised or marginalized to take back power. Um, and then at the same time, what are the what are some of the risks that come with this? I'll start um, and I'm glad to have everybody uh, have a chance to answer this. I think it's such critical questions and we could talk for so much longer about all of this. Um, but yeah, so our tool we built, um, some of the use cases are very much for the white or let's say colonizer gaze. Um, uh, many of our indigenous partners are dealing with, you know, the increased ongoing threats of colonization and are, you know, essentially turning back the tools of colonization, which is, you know, the, the Western image of what maps are, um, what photography is, what like actual data on, you know, scientific data on um, on water quality and other things, they're turning that back because they are fighting for their lives and they have to use whatever tools they can um, to try to, to save their lives and to save their cultures and their worldviews and everything else. So, so in that sense, you know, they have come to us asking for help in navigating these tools that we, um, as a mix, some indigenous, some I, I myself obviously am white. Uh, I shouldn't say I'll, anyway. My, I myself am white. You know, other member team members are kind of coming from different backgrounds. But as technologists, we're working to try to support them. Um, they also are using the tool for their own internal purposes, and sometimes we have you know no sense of what that is, which is actually an ideal situation when they are um, you know translating things into their own languages or um, creating their own kind of iconography and everything else. Um, so there are a variety of use cases, but. Um, but yeah, these tools did develop because of the ongoing harmful impacts of colonization and the need to, to fight against it with a variety of tools, including digital ones. Um, and finally, I'll just say that, uh, you know, just to speak more broadly about technology beyond kind of Web3 and digital technologies, there are so many traditional indigenous technologies that are also being used um, by our partners in, in, the, in these fights for, for their lives, um, oral tradition and so many other so many other details and different ways of creating maps. So there's so much more I could say about that, but I just really appreciate the question. I think it's something that's critical for us to talk about. And Clara, I know that you have to jump. If you have 30 seconds, um, you know, would love to hear your thoughts. And if not, totally understand. I apologize for putting you on the spot. Like, yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I will just make a quick point. In Web3, there is a term called going Satoshi, which means going anonymous. And I think that's there's a really great opportunity where in Web3, I, a lot of people can choose to actually appear as who they are, or they can, you know, there is a better culture around just being an avatar, right? And I think there is a degree of more marginalized voices being able to have equal footing. And I've, I've just studied and watched this happen. And I, I find it fascinating because I don't know who I'm talking to behind the screen, but they're saying intelligent things, right? Whereas um, there's a lot of conversations that often happen in more formalized circle where people can't speak um, how they're truly feeling. And so for me, that element is is really um, interesting to watch. I haven't decided whether that's good or bad, but I do feel like there is an opportunity for stronger voices to, to come about when you can also protect your identity at the same time. 
Bye, Clara, I know you have to go. Thank you so much. And, and Martin, any, any final words? And we'll, we'll wrap up with that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I, I was just thinking um, when uh, uh, through that question from Tiara and what Emily was saying about um, system change thinking, um, which is kind of all about um, empowering people um, through um learning and designing strategies and um uh, collaboration engagement that sort of stuff um and there's a really great example called isla urbana um, which is about water management in uh, mexico city um which is which uses this framework um to kind of uh, empower the people in the spaces in Mexico City that need water the most to kind of make sure that they get water. Um, there's a there's a YouTube video. I'm gonna look it up and put it in the chat. Hang on. Um, um, yeah, which shows you how you can kind of actually change the whole system. Then I think that is something that can be replicated. Um, and maybe you know we can all think of projects like that. Well, I, I realize that we're, we're a little past the hour and just wanted to say a, a tremendous thank you, not only to our amazing panelists, um, but also to, to everyone who, who listened and attended and, and asked questions. We'll send updates. Um, we will have a recording of this available and we'll be doing another one um, next month. Leah, any final thoughts from your end? Uh, just huge gratitude. This is one of my favorite things to do every month. So I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for being so great in the chat. Uh, and with that, um, I will just say, have a good April, everyone. And we'll, we'll let you know when the next one's happening.